So uh, I just celebrated three years at the Royal Bright Church. It was supposed to be six months. Somehow or another, we convinced me to stay. And uh, so I've been there for three years. In three years, I've done 205 weddings and 26 funerals. Uh, up until that point, I think in my whole career, I had done maybe 10 weddings, 15 weddings maybe, and like five funerals. Uh, so a very different uh, set of circumstances up here in uh, Northeast Iowa. I started last Sunday talking to you about uh, priorities and the importance of, of priorities, how we view our life and how we establish priorities in life is the most important thing to us. And as I just read to us, probably one of the clearest statements in Scripture uh, from the Lord Jesus himself about priorities and uh, how to look at life and how to evaluate what are the most important things to us. He said things like, no one can serve two masters, you're going to hate one or love the other. They can't love God and money. Uh, or, uh, you know, we understand, of course, that uh, money's not the root of all evil, it's the love of it that's the root of all evil. And so, uh, a lot of people's priorities is basically accumulating, accumulating right here. And uh, some people just get wealthier and wealthier. I think Jeff Bezos is now worth $177 billion. That's a lot of money in energy's economy. And so there's a lot of very, 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 very wealthy people out there. And, uh, you know, we are not probably part of that group, but uh, we watch from afar and wonder, you know, I wonder what Jeff Bezos does every day. You ever wonder that? You know, when, when does he get up? And what does he have for breakfast? And, you know, what's his agenda? Does it come out his like, day plan and think, okay, I need to make another 20 billion today, so what are we going to do to do that? You know, uh, who knows? I don't know how to do that, but we all have priorities. Every single one of us. Whether we know it or not, whether we set them or not. You know the old adage that if you plan to fail, you, you know, uh, you know, fail to plan, you plan to fail. So that's how it works. And so, we have priorities, and we talked last week about some of those. And I want to follow this on a little bit today and talk about how we need to be able to rate our priorities. How do you rate your priorities? You ever, you ever done one of those to-do lists? You do that? Yeah? To-do lists, and then you you either do it sometimes chronologically, that is what, what I need to do first, second, third, and that day, or that week, or that month, or that year, or the way you can approach it is what are the most important things for me to do. And I have to do that all the time because I've got competing priorities. We have phone calls coming in, should I do this, say that, go here, see that person first of all. So all the time you deal with it, whether you're in business or in the ministry. I remember one time uh, when I was in Austin, I was pastor of a church of 500 people, and uh, I actually got called for a CEO's job somewhere. I don't know why, but somebody called me and invited me in to interview for this job. So I'm sitting there, and the guy looks me straight in the face and says, why would we make the CEO of this company when I see your resume as be, you've been a pastor for the biggest part of your life rather than business? Yeah. And I asked the guy, I said, how do you motivate your employees? With about, I don't know, five, six hundred people. Not in front. I said, he said, what do you mean? I said, well, how do you get them to do what you want them to do? What you want them to do? He said, well, I'll pay them. I said, yeah, that's right. And if you don't, if they don't do it, what do you do? He said, well, fire them. I said, well, that's easy. I've done that. Hired a lot of people, fired a lot of people, interviewed a lot of people. I said, so you motivate them by money, right? And benefits. I said, try doing that with 500 volunteers. And you don't pay a single thing to try and get 500 people lovingly and willingly to do stuff in your company without getting paid a shekel. Because that's what the church is. It's all voluntary. And I think you got the message. Um, but we need to be able to rate our priorities. Now, what I mean by that? Here's what Jesus says. He says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. Here's what Jesus is not saying. He's not saying it's an evil to be wealthy. That's not what he's saying at all. He's not saying that. He's talking about priorities. 
He's talking about where people see their priority. If our priority is only building our little empire here on earth, we've missed the point of the whole thing. Because Jesus is saying, don't make that your priority, make building for eternity your priority. Because that's a check you can cash when you die. Okay. Over Milan Cathedral, there are three inscriptions over the respective doorways there. The right hand door has a sign above it that says this all that pleases us for a moment. Over the left hand door, it reads this all that troubles is for a moment. All that pleases us for a moment. All that troubles us for a moment. Over the central door of the Cathedral of Milan, it says this nothing is important save that which is eternal. Think about it. Nothing is important save that which is eternal. That's the comfort to bear with this morning. In the word of God, as we spoke his words in the Apostle Paul, that in a sense nothing is lost for the Christian when they pass from this space and time world into eternity. The reality is we have eternal life and we will know each other in heaven. And so that which is eternal is that which you build on. Things like love are eternal. It's that eternal dimension of our life that's most important at all. What we do now has an impact for eternity. We make our memories now, if you will. What we do now has an eternal impact. It's called sowing and weeping. And sometimes we get all upset because we think, you know what? You know, I've done so much for the Lord and so much for the church. And so much and so much, and, and, and yet I don't seem to have received my reward. And I think I told you that story about the missionaries that were coming back from Africa. And then they were coming off this boat around in 1915, and they served 30 years in the missions field faithfully. And on the same ship coming back from Africa is uh, uh, Theodore Roosevelt. He's on a safari for a couple of weeks shooting lions and tigers, not tigers, but lions and elephants. <coughs> And he comes back and they talk in New York City Harbor and the band's down the bottom end and playing Hail to the Chief and there's thousands of people waving flags and there's the president coming off the ball to this accolade and this missionary who would faithfully served the Lord for 30 years in Africa is getting off and there's nobody to welcome them home. Not a soul. Not a soul. And so he's upset, cries out to God and said, Lord, you know, I've served you, my family served you faithfully for all these years. This guy's gone for two weeks and everybody's here shouting and screaming and jumping up and down and waving flags. There was not a soul here to welcome us home. He hears the voice of the Lord speaking in his heart saying, Yeah, but you're not home yet. You're not home yet. Our reward may not always catch up with us in this life, but God keeps his promises. And there is eternal reward for those who faithfully serve Him. We store up for eternity. We're storing up now for an unknown impact in the life to come. In 2 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul says, says these words. Therefore, we do not lose heart. He said, we don't give in. We don't give up. And the reason for that, he says, is this. Though inwardly, though outwardly, I should say, we are wasting away. Yet inwardly, we can be being renewed day by day. So let me ask you this. What is the most important part of our being? What do you think? I think it's this. Well, we go to, we eat right. We exercise. Well, when I say we, I'm talking to you. <laughs> uh, so I've got a gym membership like all the rest of us that got a gym membership and a personal trainer. I've seen it twice. Uh, but what I'm saying is we spend all this time trying to keep ourselves going, to, trying to keep ourselves fit, trying to keep ourselves looking half decent. You know, my wife, as you all know, works in the good industry where she's surrounded by all these folks who want to stay young. And she deals with plastic surgeons and Botox and all that kind of good stuff that's the TV all the time. And people are obsessed by not aging. But you know what? Guess what? It happens, right? It 
happens. I'm a testament to that. And so is every one of you. You know, and, and as much as you want to keep the wrinkles away, guess what? There's just not enough plastic surgery and not enough Botox and whatever else, you know, to keep you looking like a 16 year old. It doesn't happen that way. But we, well, here's my point we spend so much time and so much money and so much effort trying to keep this old thing going. Look at our bodies. There's nothing wrong with that. But how many of us are prioritizing feeding our spirit? Feeding our heart, feeding our relationship with the Lord. Because that's the part that's eternal. Not this part. This part will waste away, like Paul says. But it's our spirit that's eternal. That's the one thing that we saw with Linda. That even as she's wasting away because of cancer in her body, her spirit is so strong. And that's something we can take a lesson from because this will eventually waste away. You know, the mortality rate is 100%. But if we are a believer in the Lord Jesus, we go on. Our spirit lives on. Here's what Paul says. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed by day, by day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Because we fix our eyes. Listen carefully to this, folks. We fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary. But what is unseen is a terror. We need to think about that a lot more at times than we think about. Am I building for eternity? Am I investing in eternity? Not just in me, not just in my spiritual life, but what about our investment in others for eternity? The way that we share our faith, the way that we disciple other people, the way that we care for each other, you know, when we go through difficult times like bereavement or sickness or financial distress or relational distress or whatever you're going through. How do we deal with that? It's so important. So we need to be able to rate ourselves in the light of eternity. And also we need to be able to rate our priorities in the light of God's provision. Verse 32, what Ty Renta says this, for the pains run after all these things. What did, Paul, what did Paul mean here? What did the Lord mean here? What he meant was this. People out there in the world are obsessed with accumulation. It's like, who is the most toys wins? You ever seen that? I've got, I used to have a brother-in-law. There's one of these guys that you always had to have the thing that was better than the thing you just bought. You ever met people like that? You know, the kind of guy that said, hey, I just got a fantastic deal on a brand new F-150, you know, blah, 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 and you tell this guy, and he would say, oh, I could have got you that for half price. And I just bought one for that. Oh, you know, that kind of thing. It really became annoying. And the reason was because he was so obsessed with things. His identity was wrapped up in his stuff. And if you take the stuff away, what are you left with? So when I was in Austin, you read it at the leave to head to the Virgin Islands and a really, really nice little sports car, a BMW Z4, a big fancy Harley and all that. I knew I couldn't take them with me because you know, the roads there are terrible and, you know, it's dangerous and all. So, you know, I saw them. And I had friends that came along and said to me, oh, I can't even imagine you selling your sports car. I can't even imagine you selling your bike. And my response is, they're only stuff. They're not my identity. Oh, by the way, I'm selling my Harley if anyone wants to buy a sports car, just to let me know. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, it's just stuff. It comes and goes, right? And that's why Paul was able to say, you know what, I can live with a lot. I can live with nothing. And Paul knew about that. He knew about what it meant to have plenty. And then Paul knew it was to have nothing to be in a Roman prison for the faith. And then what does he say after that? He says, you know what? I can do all these things through Christ's strength. 
So I can be here with a ton of stuff. If that's the Lord's will, great. And I can be over here with nothing. And that's just as great because I'm not defined by my stuff. If I was running the school system, um, which you probably don't want, but if I was running the school system, here's what I would do. At the end of your high school experience, I would not allow anybody to go to college right away, or work right away. I'd fly them to the middle of Africa, or somewhere in Asia, or even just south of the border of Mexico. We used to take people 30 to 50 kids on a regular basis because they run to the border, down to Nuevo Laredo and down to Saltillo. And that's all like three hours south of the U.S. border. And there are people there living in John Deere crates, you know, packing crates. That's their home, packing crates. With the tarp over the top, some bricks on top of hold the tarp down. Two hours south of our border. I'm not talking about Middle Africa. And every time I took a whole bunch of kids out there, it changed my life. No Nintendo. No 70 inch color TV. You know, none of that stuff that we take for granted. And yet the Christians living down there, living like that, are happy in that condition. Why? Because it's not a, you know, would they like a better house? I'm sure they would. It's not about that. It's not about what we accumulate. It's about what we accumulate up there. There's a story of a church that invited that they'd been supporting this missions ministry in Congo, I think it was, for a number of years. And so they decided to bring uh, one of the members of that church, I think it was the pastor's wife, over to the state. She'd never been out to Congo. She had never been to, obviously, the U.S. And so they flew her over and she landed at night time, I think it was LAX or somewhere like that, and they picked her up so it was dark and she was just looking around the airports. You know, we'd never been in a plane before, so it was like a huge experience. And she arrives home, and they're, they're, they're hosting her at their home, and so she arrives at the house and uh, pretty much immediately goes to bed because long trip, goes to bed and gets up the next morning, goes down for breakfast, and she's just looking at this, this amazing house. Which was not a fancy house, apparently, but just amazing to her. And so she's standing in the kitchen and she looks out the window, and this particular house had a detached garage. She looks out there and she says, Oh, what's that? And the guy said, oh, That's where we put our car. And she goes, Oh, you have a house for your car? That's the reality, folks, for most of the world. <coughs> the point is, I'm not speaking about missions this morning, but what I'm saying is this, is that sometimes we major on the minors. We put more, so much stock in that which wastes away, as opposed to that which is a terrible. Investing in people, investing in our own spiritual life, is so, so important. And lastly, we need to realize what, most importantly, what Jesus' priorities are. Remember years ago, all those bracelets that we wear, WWJD, remember that, what would Jesus do? You remember that time? Rubber bracelets. Because people were trying to get folks to think about, well, before you make a decision, what do you think the Lord would do? So here's some things that I want to share with you, because Jesus, at the end of this, this uh, discourse, says this, but... Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added. Seek first the kingdom of God. So the question is, what does that mean? What does it mean to seek first the kingdom of God? I believe it means to seek his priorities, which are the things that are eternal. Like what? Like loving and serving God. Let me ask you this. Do you think there's a reward there? Yeah, that's the answer, that's the right answer. Yes, there is. Colossians 3, whatever you do, work it with all your heart as working for the Lord and not for men. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. 
And so in everything that we do, if we do it towards the Lord, we can build our eternal profile, our eternal inheritance. What about suffering for Christ? Is there a reward there? When we criticize for our faith, you know, you're one of these nutcase Christians, believe all this goofy stuff. You know, some of you may have heard that. Some of you have been persecuted for your faith. You know, at least verbally. Is there a reward there? Is there a heavenly reward? Yes. Matthew 5, 11. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. So there's a reward in being persecuted. What about doing good? Is there a reward there eternally? Yeah. Ephesians 6, 8. Because you know that the Lord will reward everyone for whatever good he does. Revelation 22, 12. Behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me. And I will give to everyone according to what he has done. What about forgiving others? Is there a reward there? Absolutely. Matthew 6. Verses 14 and 15. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you don't, then he won't, basically. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added to you. So what are the other things? What does that mean? Well, the other things are the stuff that Jesus mentioned in the other part of this chapter, are necessary things like food, drink, clothing, shelter. We're not talking about brand new BMWs, we're talking about homes in the Hamptons, we're talking about the basics of life, basics to keep us alive, he has promised. G.K. Chesterton, who was a great English author and philosopher, said this, there are two ways to get enough. One is to accumulate more and more, right? That's like the American way, accumulate more and more. What's the other one? What do you think it is? Two ways to get enough. One is to accumulate more and more. The other is the exact opposite. Is to need less and less. You ever gone through that? Ever tried that for a while? That's a really interesting concept to try and say, oh, I'm going to live rather than here, I'm going to live like here for a while. Just to see. When uh, I moved to the, the States, we had a beautiful big Victorian house in Scotland that we sold to fund our studies. Um, absolutely gorgeous place, kind of rosewood and all that kind of stuff. So we sold a lot of our cars and all of our bits and pieces to move to the US. And we lived in the trail. And then we lived in this house that had more roaches in it. I, and I'd never seen those flying things in Florida, those tornado bugs or whatever. I mean, they fly at you. They would look flat like that, like bats, but smaller. And so it's like totally freaked out. But you know what? That was probably one of the happiest times of my life. We had this old beat up car, we had this terrible house or this trailer or whatever else, or and yet we knew that we were serving the Lord, so all of that didn't matter because we were building, we were studying for eternity. Now, again, I'm saying to you, God's not got a problem with you having wealth. That's not the issue. The issue is priorities. What is most important to us, and what are we building for eternity? That's the most important. Mark Buchanan, author that I like, called this whole thing the attitude of enough. I'd love to ask Jeff Bezos that. Hey buddy, when's enough enough? If you have $177 billion, you know, net worth, would you work? <laughs> I'd, I'd probably hunting and fishing and, you know, traveling the world and, you know, lying on the beach in St. Thomas and, and not doing a thing because I've got enough. So when's enough enough? This is what he said. He says, it's a spiritual orientation marked by trust, contentment, and thankfulness. It is the decision without rationalization to say, this is enough. My home's big enough, my car's new enough, my possessions are plenty enough. I've eaten enough, I've taken enough, enough is enough. He goes on to say, and when we begin to live out the spirituality of enough, there comes a point where we see that maybe we have more than enough. 
in the scheme of things, in the world context, let me tell you, I don't know your financial position, but compared to the world, we have more than enough. We have more than enough. And I'm so glad that this great nation funds so many nations. We even fund people that don't like us at all. Which is kind of strange, but that's kind of how we are. And how we've always been. I've seen the product of that in Africa and different nations in the world where those big bags of grain that come over the sets from your friends in the USA, people are thrilled to be fed. So we have a very benevolent nation, I believe. So what's the point of all of this? The point of all of this is real simple. What's our priority? Are we building for eternity? Are we doing the things that have eternal worth? Are we so focused down here that we've lost sight There are some people that can be so heavenly minded that no earthly use at all. And there are some people that are so bound by this life that they're not even thinking about what's to come. And that's important to the Lord and I think it's important to us as Christians that we build for eternity as individuals, as families, as the church. And that the things that we lay down, we invest in have the best return. I, for a number of years, worked for Cummins Diesels, I was a capital fat planning analyst, and return investment analysis knowledge. You buy a big million dollar machine tool, how much time does it take out of the job, how does it save you money? What's the best ROI you can get? Let me tell you this, the best ROI, return on investment, is what you do for a terror. That's got the best return. Not the 0.03% we get in the bank these days for interest or whatever it is. But you know, God always pays out. He always does. I remember a guy called, uh, he's, a, he's a Louisiana preacher. And he's in this African American church visiting. And they're taking the offering. And so the offering went with this. And I've been a few black churches, and sometimes offering is really the funniest part of the whole thing. And the old preacher says, well, we got a broken window over here. You know, we need to pay for that. Eh? Anybody want to pay for the window? And we're all sitting down in front of you. I'll pay for it. There's only one guy in the place. I'll pay for it. And they said, well, we've got problems with the plumbing. You know, this is it. We're going to cost us about 1500 but I'll pay for it. This goes on. We've got a couple of shingles off. Water. I'll pay for it. And so eventually his wife elbows him and says, hey, we quit. We're going to be broke if you keep on doing this. He was well known, so he said to his wife, okay, get your, put on your fur coat and let's head on down. So he took her down to Siemens Mission where he used to speak a lot. Never been to Siemens Mission New in New Orleans. And so he walks in with his wife and says, hey boys, over, hi Bob. He said, guys, I want to ask you one question for the benefit of my darling wife here. He said, how many of you are in this place today because you gave too much to God. We cannot give God because the poor that we shovel in, he shovels back and his shovel is way bigger than ours. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us, Lord, as we analyze and look at our life and our life priorities to make sure that we are seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, that we're building a spiritual nest egg, if you will, in heaven. Help us to plan and to practice that which lasts for eternity as our priority. In Jesus' name we pray.